went back after being fired and having my first run in New York. When I went back in 84 to beat the Iron Sheik, Vince wanted to cross all the imag all those imaginary boundaries, you know, and I'm going, wow, this is going to be dangerous. So Vince says, are you up for it? I said, yeah, I'll do it. And so Vince stayed in, in Connecticut in Greenwich in the office, and, you know, then I was booked in Lafayette, Louisiana. We pump our signal in there for like eight weeks. You know, prime example is Kansas City. I don't know if you ever heard of a wrestler named Harley Race. Yeah, of course. NWA champion, tougher than hell, meaner than a snake. Great guy, though, okay? We pumped the signal into Kansas City for eight weeks. And Harley Race has been there like 18 years. He was the NWA champion. I'm the champion of the world, and he's a very proud and mean son of a bitch. And all of a sudden, here comes this blonde-haired idiot from New York going, hey, I'm the WWF champion. I'm the <laughs> WWE champion. I'm coming to Kemper Arena. And we're pumped the signal. So I come. I fly into town. And I show up about 2 in the afternoon. My guy's calling me. Harley Race came down here with a gun. And he tried to light the ring on fire. Whoa. And the co had the cops ran, ran him up, and they didn't arrest him. I went, oh, shit. And they told me, Harley said, when I show up, he's going to kill you. So I go across the street, and I go to the Rusty Scupper, this bar, right? And I am I was notorious at the time for not kind of like being on time because the matches would start like at 7.30 or 8 o'clock, and they wanted you to the building at 6.30. I'd come rolling at about 9.30, you know, after intermission, and I'd have time to put my boots on because I don't want to talk about wrestling. I just want to go do it, mm. you know? It's like playing guitar or anything. It's like chess. You think two, three moves ahead. And so now I don't need to be at the building early. I damn sure don't want to run into Harley Race. You know, this guy's going to kill me. I'm scared to death of him anyway. I've known him since I was a kid. You know, So now I'm across the rusty scupper drinking bottles of wine, drinking bottles of wine. And now i got to go to the building, okay? So now I go to the building, and I had to go to the bathroom, and my stomach was killing me. So I'm sitting there on the toilet going to the bathroom. And I don't know if you know a wrestler named Davy Boy Smith, the British Bulldog. Yep. Yep. Oh, my God, the fucking king is here. The fucking king is here. He's going to kill you, Hogan. Davy Boy comes in and screams at me. I pull my wrestling yellow tights up. Don't even wipe my ass. Ugh. You know, as fast as I could because I don't want to get caught with my pants down and I don't want to have a fighting chance. I come blowing out of the bathroom. I turn around the corner. He puts that gun right in my face. And we're in Kemper Arena. And he goes, you know what? I should kill you, Hogan, for coming in here and doing this. And this is Harley Race talking to me. And then he puts the gun down. He goes, but I really need a job. Wow. I went, holy shit. You know, holy shit. I shook his hand, brother. And I was a huge fan. Loved the guy to death anyway. But that's the type of stuff me and Vince were doing. <laughs> we're going to other people's territories. And then, you know, you go through, you know, you go to hotel rooms and stuff. You never know when stuff's going to put crap in your bag or stuff like that. We went down to Puerto Rico. But anyway, Harley became a good friend again, and I knew him before I was a fan. He used to come hear the band play and everything. But anyway, like going down to Puerto Rico, first time we go down to Puerto Rico, I've never been to Puerto Rico before. All the boys tell me how violent it is. They cut you. They burn you with cigarettes. They throw everything at you in Puerto Rico. So I'd never been. I didn't need to go. But now Vince wants to go down to Puerto Rico, and Carlos Colon had the territory there for like 30 or 40 years. So here we come. And I go rolling down to Puerto Rico with Cindy Lauper with me, right? <laughs> so I go down to Puerto Rico, and we have the match, and we saw the stadium. Me and Macho Man go back to the room, and we go walk in his room, and his room is trashed. His room is trashed. And so all of a sudden, I go, oh, my God, let me go to my room. So all of a sudden, I go to my room, and I don't want to say the guy's name, but when I open the, the door... He's sitting there, because he's still really active, and he's sitting there with a gun. He says, if you ever come back here, I'm going to kill you. So okay. That, I was going back to Tampa. I hauled ass to the airport. I got on an Eastern Airlines flight, the last one out of town, and flew to L.A. Wow. <laughs> I was supposed to be going home to Tampa. About four months later, Bruiser Brody goes down there, has a little argument. The booker calls him into the shower, cuts his throat, and kills him. Jesus Christ. So that's down there in Puerto Rico. Jesus Christ. Yeah. I don't know if you guys ever heard the Brody story. The yeah, promoter that... cut his throat and killed Well, he killed was the him? booker. He was one of the invaders, um, Rodriguez. And uh, 
Brody was kind of hard to do business with in the ring. He's really stiff and would beat the shit out of you. He wouldn't put anybody over. And he was you know, he was a big big man, six foot eight, three hundred thirty pounds, in crazy shape. And you know they wanted to beat him. He was nah, not tonight, brother. You know? Wow. So after the match, they said, hey, Jose wants to talk to you in the shower. Brody went walking the shower. He jumped him, cut his throat, and died right there. And all the wrestlers that saw it were afraid to go back and testify. So that's. So it, it, it can get crazy. You know? That's about as crazy as it yeah, gets. Yeah. So you guys were the first ones to break those boundaries and kind of barnstorm the whole country like that. Vince is a gangster. Bro. Yeah. That's such the, a the gangster The whole country. Move. How about going to Germany or South Africa? You know, because they had wrestling over there too. How about blowing in South Africa and you know, getting challenged by the South African heavyweight champion, Wilhelm Ruska, that judo guy. My God, it, it goes on and on and on. You know with how crazy it got you know what was that like it was different you know the good thing was everywhere i went i had like the crew with me you know except for when i went to south africa that was a little different but everywhere i went it was always the crew and the wwe 20 or 30 wrestlers that was, were there so you felt a lot better right you know, i try not to peel off on my own too often <laughs> You right, know, especially when we're walking someone else's backyard that they've been promoting wrestling for 30, 40, 50 years, and all of a sudden you come here. And they have the same sort of unspoken rules out there. And we broke them all. Wow. Yeah, I never even considered that as a possibility that uh, there, there would be these territories. Well, that's what one I'm of the totally. main things that made Vince Jr. so famous and changed the game forever. Vince Sr. always wanted him. He Wasn't it like a promise, a handshake deal? You can handshake have the company, deal. son, but just please don't ever mess with the other territories. And Vince it's is like, like Vince okay. Told, it's like, <laughs> like Vince told me, he goes, if my dad knew what we were getting ready to do, he would have never sold me the territory. Yeah. Wow. And I'm like, okay. He goes, you up for us? Yeah. Let's do it. Was the dad alive when this was going down? For a while. Yeah? For a while, he had pancreatic cancer. Ooh. And uh, he was alive. Like, when I went back, when I went back, oh, God, it's such a crazy story. I hate to get into all this stuff, but it's all true. Mm. Like, when I went back, I had just been in Minnesota, <clears throat> spent three years. Hulk Hogan had really that Hulkamania thing and started there. And I, I was on fire there. I mean, really on fire. And so now when I go back to New York, Vince had flown to my house. We talked about doing a deal. So I said, on a certain day, I'm coming back to New York. I did two, three weeks of TV. Then when I was supposed to be the Iron Sheik for the belt that night, Vince Sr. was there. And he always had these half glasses that he'd look over, and he's always clicking quarters together when he talked to you. 